Hi everybody, it's Dr. Sean Talbot. Um, I'm coming to you live from, uh, my, from my hotel room here in Anaheim, California. Um, I'm out here for the Natural Products Expo. Um, a big show, there'll be 80,000 people here uh, starting today and going through the weekend, um, all around natural products. This is, the, this is the, the expo last year where Amare won the Nutra Award, you know, which is the award for the best new finished product in the entire natural products industry. And we won that for our fundamentals pack, our gut brain axis pack, which is mentabiotics, mentafocus, and mentasync all wrapped up into a pack. It was, it, you know, one of the reasons it, it was, it was awarded is because it was the world's first coordinated gut brain access system. And it's a part of this B3 program that we're talking about. So within B3, you're getting the fundamentals. So you're getting your gut brain access modulation. You're getting Vita GBX, which is our take on a, on a multivitamin that not just nourishes the body, but also nourishes the mind. Um, plus our full line of GBX foods, functional foods, GBX standing for gut brain access. Um, so that's our, that's our plant protein, that's our seed fiber, and that's our superfood. So you're getting all of that nutrition to help not just nourish your microbiome, but help with your energy levels and help with your stress levels and help with your anxiety levels and then optimize that entire gut brain axis. So um, we're doing a research study on that entire B3 program. Um, and so tonight is the, is, the, is the lecture or the seminar about the nutrition piece of it. And so I'm going to talk specifically about nutrition for mental wellness. And I'll tell you what the secret is. The secret is there's no secret. It really is pretty straightforward and very, very easy. One of my pet peeves is um, sort of the, uh, the, the, the nutrition fadism that we have out there that, you know, somebody will come along and say, you know, there's this one food you should never eat, or there's this one food you should always eat, or there's this style of eating. You can't ever have carbohydrates, or you have to restrict your fats, or there are no hard and fast rules. One of the things I'm fond of saying is that there are about 7 billion people in the world, and that means there are 7 billion perfect diets um, around some, uh, some frameworks that we can do. So the program that we're gonna talk about tonight is, is, is very effective. It's very easy. Um, it's very uh, delicious. <laughs> um, and you'll see why it can not just help with mental wellness, but can help some of these body issues that we talk about in this program. Um, so let's get rolling here. So tonight, just to orient everybody, um, if, you, if you haven't been uh, part of the B3 program, uh, the, you know, the whole way across, you know, the reason we call it Project B3 is because it's not like a 30-day challenge or a 60-day challenge or even a 90-day challenge. It's something that we really want Want people to follow for a long period of time. And you can see why if you look back at some of, our, some of the other seminars, you can see here, March 6th, uh, we're in week three. Um, so we started on week zero with, uh, with our overview and our discussion of the supplementation, why we start with supplements, why we have people modulate their gut brain axis and control their stress first before we start doing anything else. We talk about this concept of body brain biome and if you want to look back at some of the other seminars, you can do that to get a full deep dive on what we're talking about on each of these topics. Last week, we talked about exercise. This week, we're talking about nutrition, and I'm doing that remotely from Anaheim. Um, next week, I'll be doing the stress and sleep seminar remotely from Milwaukee. The week after that, I'll be doing remotely about evaluation. How do you judge how your program is going? I'll be doing that from St. George, Utah. And then we'll be live again in class in Salt Lake City uh, for the review. And then we're going to take the, we're going to take our final message measurements on everybody. So that's sort of orienting everybody to where we are in the program. Um, and, it, you know, just, just, to, just to sort of reemphasize this, this, this idea that a lot of the things we're talking about here are body issues, right? In this program, we're, we're, we're taking measurements of people's body composition, their body fat levels, their muscle mass levels. Um, we're looking at their microbiome. We're looking at stress hormones. We're looking at cholesterol levels and blood sugar levels and all of those sorts of things. These are kind of you know, we could, we, could, we could artificially categorize those as body issues, you know, that we want to look at our belly fat levels and we want to look at, you know, how, how many calories we're burning and things like that. But if we actually step back and look at that, those aren't just body issues. A lot of those body issues, your appetite, your cravings, where you store your belly fat, start in the brain. 
they start with your level of energy and motivation and stress, which can lead to stress eating and those sorts of things. So, you know, those, what I just described, your overall mood are not just brain issues. Those actually originate in your biome. And that's why we talk a lot about microbiome balance and good versus bad bacteria and gut integrity and leaky gut and the, and the endotoxemia that can result from having a leaky gut that can lead to mood problems, that can lead to problems with our metabolism. So really, if we want to get a handle on, on any of that, how we feel, how we look, how we're performing at any level, we really need to think of this, this idea of human health in these three different pieces. So that's why, that's why it's called Project B3 body, brain, biome, right? So for people who are just sort of joining in, I'm live streaming this on Facebook at the same time. So there may be people who, this is the first time you're hearing about Project B3. Um, so let's get into the nutrition piece of it. You know, I said right at the very beginning that there's no secrets here. The secret is that there's no secret. Um, and I, I, I thought this was great. This is a, this is a screenshot from, uh, from the magazine, The Atlantic, uh, actually one of my favorite magazines. They do some wonderful journalism, some wonderful writing there. Uh, but just a couple of days ago, this, uh, this popped up on February 22nd, uh, so I, about, a, about a week ago, I guess. Um, the latest diet trend is not dieting. Here, they're talking about something called intuitive eating, which is the latest fad. And, you know, I, I just said a few minutes ago, I don't like all these sort of nutrition fadism things that come out. But what they're talking about here is listening to your body, not counting calories, not counting carb grams, not counting fat grams, not having a list of good foods and bad foods, not having any of that sort of weight of, of, of just, you know, arbitrary rules that happen. And I think this is cool because I've been doing this for 20 years uh, and educating about this for 20 years and writing books about this for 20 years around this idea. And now, now we have a cool name for it. It's called intuitive eating. Um, the, 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 the way that we're educating people to craft their meals and craft their snacks in this program, use the helping hand. This is something that, uh, I, like I said, I've been using this for, for, for at least 20 years to help people count their calories without counting their calories and put the food together in a way that is easier to digest. It's more metabolically attuned to what the body wants to see. It helps with blood sugar control. It helps with appetite levels. It helps with overall metabolism. And as a result of all of that, it makes it really easy for you to feel full and feel satiated and adhere and be compliant to that way of eating. And as a result of that, your energy is better, your mood is better, your body fat drops, right? We've seen it over and over and over again in the thousands and thousands of people at this point. And so the helping hand is uber, uber simple. You do this, right? You can see the little graphics on the screen right now. This is the, is the amount of fruits and vegetables you're going to take at each meal. You know, so that is not one, two, three, four, five. It's the size of how, what it's going to take up on your plate. So at breakfast, that could be a lovely pile of berries or mixed fruit. It could be, if you're on the go, it could be an apple and a banana. It could be, you know, it could be really whatever you are in the mood for. That's sort of the intuitive part. Your concentrated carbs are like starches um, are your are your closed fist, tightly closed fist. So that's going to be your oatmeal, your bread, your pasta, your you know those sort of your rice. Um, lean protein is going to be the size of your palm. It doesn't really matter how thick it is. That's not the important piece. The important piece is that when you, they serve you a steak at a restaurant, you're going to put your hand down and go, aha, an appropriate portion size is going to be this, the size of my palm. You're going to cut off the rest and take that home. You know, that is going to be, you know, an egg or two, depending on what your what the size of your hand is. Um, if you're vegetarian, there, there are options there, and I'll show you what some of those, some of those options could be. And then added fat is the, is the circle that your index finger and your thumb make when you make an okay sign. That can be, it can be butter, it can be olive oil, it can be guacamole, it can be, it can be so many things, and you don't want to skip that. You want to get all of these because all of these together are going to do the things that I said before. Control your, your appetite, control your cravings, modulate your blood sugar, modulate your cortisol, your stress hormone levels, um, in, in, improve your energy and your mood and your, and your metabolism and your ability to lose body fat. So this is a way that at every time you eat, you're doing that. You know, you're saying, hmm, 
what do I have access to right now? Am I home and I can go to the fridge? Am I out like me? I'm at this expo. I'm going to be sort of foraging for a lot of the day and trying to figure out what can I get at that salad bar? What can I get at that snack bar? What can I get at the restaurant that I'll be at tonight for dinner? And I'll, I'll use this same way of doing my portion control. The other piece of it that I talked about on the overview evening, so go back and look at this if you want to, is the quality piece of it. So this is the quantity. The quality side really refers to the fact that we're emphasizing very simply, eat fewer processed, eat fewer um, sort of fast packaged foods and eat food more in its whole state, in its least processed form. So, you know, an example would be apple juice would be most processed apple sauce would be less processed, and then a fresh whole apple would be minimally processed. So you want to try to keep that in mind. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll come back to this when I'm, when I'm recommending sort of, a, sort of a dietary framework in just, a, in just a couple of slides, but that idea of using the quantity and then the quality piece, trying to eat food that is as, l as little processed as possible, so you're eating more whole grains, you're eating more fresh fruits and vegetables, you're eating brightly colored, high fiber kinds of foods, um, that's going to that's gonna serve us well in terms of our overall metabolism as we go through this. So this is what the dietary pyramid has looked at, uh, ha ha has looked like for so, so long. Um, now, what you actually get is you get, you know, a dozen or so um, different plates, right, that, that are, 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 are a little bit better. But the problem here is that a lot of people still think this way. A lot of people still think that, you know, the base of our, of our diet um, still should be grains. And I know there's going to be people listening who don't like that, if you're, but, but not the kinds of grains that we're eating right now. Pro, uh, processed grains, um, refined grains, wonder bread, those sorts of things are not what we're talking about here. We're talk, when I talk about grains, I'm talking about whole grain sources, whole grain, oh, you steel cut oatmeal and you know, things like that. The, 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 the middle of this, of this pyramid is still gonna be, and I'll show you, I'll show you what, it, what it looks like now and I'll show you what it should look like. This, these are the recommendations, but this is what people are actually taking. Um, the, 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 the middle of it, sort of the sweet spot of, of really, really where we want to focus people is fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, you're going to want to be taking even more fruits and vegetables than what, what the government is recommending here. So let me, let me get to this next slide so you can see what people are actually intaking, right? So if the government's recommending what you just saw on the last slide, what people are actually intaking looks more like this. Right, so and and th this this sort of bread group down here, this grains group is mostly processed, but ninety percent processed and not not sort of unprocessed, minimally processed stuff. We're not getting enough fruits and vegetable servings. Um, we're getting a, a, a decent serving of milk and dairy, um, but this is really where it's where it's lopsided for the vast majority of people in the United States. Too many fats, oils, and sweets, and the reason for that is because we're eating too many processed. We're eating a lot of fast. Food food. We're eating a lot of packaged foods. We're eating a lot of baked goods, um, which are made with the, with the bottom part here, with our, which, are, which are made with lots of refined, refined flours and things like that. So the standard American diet is just basically, so you've probably heard this before, standard American diet is sad. It actually makes us sad. And that's primarily what I'll talk about in just a little bit. If you eat more on that side, too much salt, too much sugar, too much animal fat, too much processed and not enough unprocessed. That's really where the, where the real exclamation point needs to be. Um, too many artificial everythings, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors, artificial colors, um, lots of emulsifiers, which can actually um, disrupt a lot of what's going on in the microbiome. All of that together isn't just sad because it's a bad diet. It makes us sad. It leads to more anxiety. It leads to more stress. It leads to higher levels of depression. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that if we can get people to eat less of this, they're just automatically going to feel better. If we then can replace this kind of stuff with better quality foods, more fiber, more phytonutrients, more fermented foods, um, more brightly colored fruits and vegetables. That's going to not just make you feel better, it's going to prevent your depression. It can actually be as therapeutic as antidepressants. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show you some data for that in just a, just a little bit. So 
why is this? Let me give you a scientific lead in to what's happening here. When we're eating the wrong kind of a diet, when we're eating that standard American diet, lots of processed, lots of fried, lots of animal fat, um, the wrong kinds of fats, the inflammatory fats, um, not enough fiber, not enough phytonutrients. What we end up getting is, um, is, is, is gut damage. We get, a, a, we get a change in our microbiome. Um, people ask me all the time, and let me say this here, what's the most important thing that I can do for my microbiome? And the most important thing you can do is eat fewer processed foods and eat more fiber. That is the most important thing you can do because the fiber is what is gonna feed the good bacteria. And if you feed the good bacteria, you'll grow more of the good bacteria. If you grow more of the good bacteria, you're gonna have more of the signals that they produce, which are things like serotonin that makes us happy, dopamine that makes us motivated. You're gonna reduce inflammation in the gut and that reduction of inflammation is gonna help us feel better too. So what you're looking at here is some of the science around um, if we're if we're taking non-digestible carbohydrates, that's fiber, um, pre and probiotics. We've talked about that in other sessions before. Symbiotics, which is what Amari does, we do combinations, scientifically based combinations of probiotics, prebiotics, phytobiotics, which are phytonutrients that can help help the microbiome and help through the gut-brain axis. That's a symbiotic. Um, th th we've we've been able to show in our trials that when you use fundamentals, you have an increase in this kind of bacteria called Acromantia mucinophilia. Um, this is a this is um this is a bacteria that lives in the mucus lining. So more of this means a thicker mucus lining, which means a protected mucus, which means a protected gut lining. It means that your gut has better integrity. It means your gut is less leaky. All of that leads to having a, a, a better protection, um, uh, better absorption of nutrients, uh, less overall inflammation, less of, of that endotoxemia that I've talked about in other lectures, which can lead to metabolic problems. So if you have a good gut barrier because you've done all of these things, you're gonna have better glucose metabolism, you're gonna have better lipid metabolism, fat metabolism, you're gonna be in a healthy state. On the other side of this graph, is, is, so you're eating, you're eating fiber, you're eating brightly colored fruits and vegetables, you're supplementing the right way, over here, high fat diet, low fiber diet, high processed food diet, that's gonna give the wrong or a lacking amount of fuel for the kinds of bacteria you wanna grow. So you're not gonna grow acker, for example. You're gonna have, have a thin mucus lining. That's gonna to lead to an inflammatory state at the level of the gut lining. That's gonna cause damage. That's gonna to lead to a reduction in gut barrier function. So you're gonna have leaky gut. That's gonna to lead to changes in your, in your blood sugar control and your, and your fat metabolism. It's gonna to lead to metabolic endotoxemia like I talked about before. It's gonna to lead to inflammation. And this inflammation in the gut is then gonna be transmitted through the gut-brain axis to the other parts of the body. When that inflammation is transmitted to your fat cells, for example, that's gonna to lead to obesity. An inflamed fat cell wants to store more fat. An inflamed fat cell and an inflamed pancreas and an inflamed blood vessel lining doesn't wanna do well with, with, with glucose modulation. So, and, and an inflamed brain leads to depression and anxiety, and you have food insensitivities, food intolerances, you have cravings that you didn't have before, all because of these improper signals. So if you can beat those back, so to speak, get the inflammation down, how do you do that? Well, you, you, you improve your, your gut integrity. How do you do that? You improve your mucus lining. How do you do that? You improve the right kinds of bacteria that you're growing. How do you do that? You eat more fiber, you eat less of these processed foods. So you can see when you actually zoom back, zoom out, and you look at it with a scientific lens, it actually sounds very, very doable. Right now we have a reason for doing the things that we have on this side of the of of, of the graph. Right, we we have um we have a we have a very um, step by step targeted logical reason for doing what we're doing. Um, here's a, here's another way of looking at it. When your brain becomes inflamed, right? So think about this, right? The reason that we call these two things the two brains, the brain in our head and the brain in our gut, is because they are intimately linked to each other through your nervous system, through your immune system, which is, which is you're seeing here, 
through your inflammatory cascade, um, through your hormones and your cytokines. Cytokines are, are things like these, these, you know, this alphabet soup right here refers to different cytokines. Um, all of that signal that goes back and forth between the axis, between those two brains, the brain in your head and the brain in your gut are really, really important to make sure they're modulated. And if you are, if you're not addressing that, those signals can go haywire in a, in a certain sense, right? Your immune system is off, your inflammatory cascade is off, and those signals will become disrupted, leading to some of these problems, you know, leading to pain, leading to inflammation, leading to depression. Um, and so, and so this, is, this is what we're trying to do. This is why people who do this program, this Project B3 program, feel so much better and almost as a side effect or a side benefit of feeling better, they lose weight and they lose belly fat. And they almost feel like they didn't try. And, that, and that's one of the coolest things about this is, you know, people lose the weight. They lose the inches on their, on their waistline. And, and they almost come back and say, like, I don't feel like I deserved it. I don't feel like I worked hard enough because I felt really great while I was doing this. And the weight just seemed to go. And it's because we're changing your metabolism, but we're starting at the level of the gut. At the, in fact, even deeper than that, at the level of the microbiome. And so here's, here's how we actually educate people to you know, p choose their foods. Remember I said it's, it's intuitive eating, it's the helping hand. That helping hand has been taught to second graders, right? It's really, really easy to follow. But you wanna make sure that you're not using the helping hand to choose Pop-Tarts or to choose donuts or to choose you know, uh, you know, something through the, through the drive-through, right? What we want people to do is follow a Mediterranean diet, right? So remember those gross pyramids that I just showed you a little while ago that, you know, one of those pyramids came from the USDA. One of those pyramids was sort of, you know, using USDA statistics, showing what people are actually eating. And you can see where, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of geared more towards these processed foods. This is really what we want to be eating on a, on a daily basis. Now, let me say something about that. Um, I'm an 80-20 guy when it comes to nutrition. Um, it, you need to follow something like this, what you see on the screen right now, 80% of the time. The 20% are gonna be the times when you have parties to go to, or birthdays, or celebrations, or a cheat day, or a vacation, or something like that. So, you know, this, this idea of intuitive eating, of listening to how those foods make you feel, um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll become more attuned to that. You'll become more used to listening to those signals. Um, so this Mediterranean diet pyramid starts with this. These are all things we've been talking about already in this Project B3. Social connection, exercise, daily physical activity, um, that kind of stuff is really, really important. Now we're gonna come back and talk more about, we talked about exercise last time, but we'll come back and we'll talk about the social connection piece um, when we talk about stress, when we talk about evaluation. It's something that sort of weaves through everything that we're talking about. But the base of the food part of the pyramid really is, I love this illustration, look at all these brightly colored fruits and vegetables and spices and nuts. And you know, you're looking at things that some, sometimes people think they should avoid, potatoes, whole grains, um, olive oil, you know, all of these kinds of things, these should, these should be the basis of what we're eating every single meal, every single day. You can see them sort of, sort of listed out here. Um, that's what you wanna do. When we're choosing proteins, we wanna to try to focus on good fats as much as possible. The best way to get that is with fatty fish, fatty seafood. And so those are the times when you can recommend to people salmon and tuna and sardines and anchovies and, and oysters and you know, things like mackerel and bluefish. And, but you know, when I rattle some of those off, you can see people in the audience making a face because the, you know, and, and then when you ask them about it, they say, well, those all taste fishy, right? That's the, that's the fat. That, that's the omega-3 fatty acids that make the fish taste that way. When we're choosing fish like cod and haddock and uh, tilapia and, you know, God forbid, fish sticks, um, you know, when we're, when we're choosing things like that, we're getting a decent source of protein, okay? But we're not getting those omega-3 fatty acids. The reason that's so important is omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. And on the last few slides, I, I talked about why we don't want inflammation anywhere. We don't want it in our gut. 
We don't want it in our brain. Having it in the gut's gonna lead to these metabolic problems. Having it in the brain's gonna lead to these psychological problems. So we wanna lower that and omega-3s can do that very, very effectively. Um, the, the other piece of it is that omega-3s seem to be essential for the effect, the mood effect, of our neurotransmitters. And so you could have you know, the right level of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, um, but they can't do their job as effectively if your omega-3 levels are lower than they're supposed to be. So if you're suppressed in omega-3s, in a sense, those, those neurotransmitters aren't able to dock where they need to in the brain. And so we want to make sure, and there's great data to show if you're suppressed or if you're deficient in omega-3s, you're at a higher risk for depression and anxiety and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, things like that. So you want to make sure that your omega-3 levels are up and fatty fish is a great way to do that. If you're not going to eat that, if you're not going to do this at least twice a week, a good serving of salmon, for example, um, then you need the supplement. Simple as that. You need to take a fish oil supplement. Uh, and there's, we, we actually do a, do a very nice one at Amari. Um, weekly, you're going to do moderate portions of poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt, right? So yogurt is actually one thing that I think could slide down a little bit um, and, and be taken on a daily basis. I eat a yogurt almost every single morning as a way to help establish the right pH level in my gut so that I can grow the good bacteria that I'm supplementing with. Um, I, I actually use, I use a full fat uh, yogurt, uh, low sugar yogurt. This is one of the challenges was looking in the yogurt aisle is that a lot of the yogurts are very, very high in sugar. How high? As high as a soda. Um, you, a lot of the, look at the label sometimes and you're going to see 20, 30, 40 grams of sugar in a little yogurt, yogurt cup. And so don't do that. Um, because it's made with milk, you're going to see, you know, um, uh, sugar grams around the sort of seven, eight, 10, because, because there's, there's naturally occurring milk sugars, but you want to make sure you're not going above that. You don't want to be above 10 grams of sugar in that yogurt. And so if you're balancing, if, you, if, if you're looking at your labels and you're choosing the right yogurt, you should be able to balance the protein with the sugar content, you know, 10 and 10, eight and eight, something like that. So that's a, that's a, that's a guideline you can look at, but you know, here's where we're going to use the, here's where we're going to use the, you know, the palm size when we're choosing our eggs and our poultry and things like that. And then up here at the top, you want to consider red meat as a, as a, as a side dish, as a condiment on, a, on, a, on, a, on an infrequent basis. You want to think of sweets, desserts, and things like that as something you're not having at every single meal or at every single dinner. This is a, this is a treat. You know? Sometimes you're having it, sometimes you're not. And when you're having it, enjoy it. Don't feel guilty about it. You know, enjoy that thing that you're doing. Over here on the left-hand side, you can see water every day, lots and lots of water. Water's gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna hydrate us, our whole bodies, which is gonna be good. Um, it's going to hydrate all this lovely, wonderful fiber that we're eating. So that's gonna help it move through the gastrointestinal tract. And that's gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna reduce our gas and our bloating. It's gonna improve our digestion. It's gonna improve our overall motility going through there. But all of that, will improve the pH, the, the acid base balance, all the way from the mouth, all the way down to where it all comes out. We wanna make sure that all of that pH, all of that acid base balance is optimized because having an optimized pH is gonna set up the right environment for the right bacteria to grow. You're gonna grow more of the good guys where you're supposed to, and you're gonna grow less of the bad guys, and they, and they won't grow in, in places where they're not supposed to be. Um, and then this last one, you know, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a, a drinker, um, great. You can, you can have wine in moderation. That's about a, one glass a, a day for women two glasses a day for men. Um, but if you're not, if you're not a drinker, uh, if you don't consume alcohol, this isn't a, you know, it, this isn't a recommendation to start. It just, if you are, then, you know, you can, you can reap the benefits of that. So there's some benefits actually of, of the alcohol portion in moderation. The big benefit though of this is the, is the flavonoids, is the polyphenols. These are the same kinds of things. So the, so the, the compounds that make red wine red or purple, are flavonoids, are, are, are polyphenols. These are the same things that make a lot of these fruits and vegetables brightly colored. That's why we say brightly colored is bright is better. The bright color indicates high flavonoids 
or high carotenoids or other high uh, um, phytonutrients that are going to be good for the microbiome, that are going to be good for your gut integrity, that are going to be good for your inflammation, that are going to be good for your neuro um, neurotransmitter balance. This is one of the reasons that at Amare, we've actually filed global patents on certain combinations of these phytonutrients because they have these benefits across the entire gut-brain axis. And modulating gut-brain axis is a really important part of helping people to feel better, helping people improve their, improve their mood state. So why do I, you know, people have heard me talk about um, the Mediterranean diet, what you just saw in that pyramid, in, in glowing, glowing terms, like that it's gonna, it's gonna save your health from, from, from really any aspect. And the reason that I say that is because, um, and that I'm such an advocate of that style of eating, is that it's been studied far and away more um, and more extensively than any other eating plan. Um, you know, large populations, I, we're, we're talking here tens of thousands of subjects in these trials that have been followed for years and years and years to see things like this. Lower risk of heart disease, cardiovascular disease, lower risk of cancer, lower risk of metabolic syndrome, which is, which is diabetes, um, uh, improvements in brain structure and function. So it's not just that your brain is sharper, like it is on this last bullet point, uh, a, a, a reduction in Alzheimer's uh, risk. And if you have Alzheimer's, an improvement in your, in your activities of daily living, your improvement in being able to do things throughout the day. So it's not just a functional benefit where your brain is working better, there's a structural benefit where your neurons are healthier and stronger. And recently, last couple of years, we've also shown that it not only can it prevent depression, it can actually treat depression that you have right now. And I'll show you some data for that in a little bit. So, you know, you look at this list and you would think to yourself, why in the world would I not eat the Mediterranean style as much as possible? It's, it's pretty available. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to put together. I'm going to show you some meals in just a little bit. Um, it's uh, so, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's delicious. A lot of times people will look at that and they'll go, well, I don't even know where to start. Well, one of the easiest ways to start is at lunch and dinner, have a salad with lots of brightly colored stuff and put a piece of grilled salmon on top of that, have a salad and put some sliced chicken on top of that. Like that's a Mediterranean style of eating and it's, and it's, and it's lovely. Um, so, and so anyway, I'll show you some pictures in just a little bit. So wh why is this good? So here's the areas that it's been studied, but why is it good for all of those, those, those reasons? Well, one reason is that it's good for your microbes. That microbiome, remember starting with B3, to get these body benefits, we look to the brain. To get those brain benefits, we look to the biome. And the biome, the high ratio of plant to animal-based foods, you know, the base of that, of that Mediterranean diet pyramid is whole grains and brightly colored fruits and vegetables and lots of fiber so that you're giving the, the, the plant material to the good bacteria, you're depriving the bad bacteria of the animal-based kinds of things. This doesn't mean you have to become a vegan. It just means that you have to have a plant slant to your, to your plan, right? So instead of meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes can still be part of your plan, but it's now on the side. It's a side dish. It's not, the, it's not front and center with a side salad. It's the salad as the front and center with the side meat, or this, you know, you guys get the, you guys get the picture. It gives you anti-inflammatory effects, gut, brain, and body. And that's, and that's really what we're trying to do. So yeah, I might sound like a broken record, but these are really, really important points for us to get across again and again and again, because most of us, if you're my age, you didn't grow up with this as your focus. Um, and if you did, fantastic. But most of us grew up with sort of, you know, TV dinners and, you know, that kind of stuff. So high concentration of antioxidants, polyphenols, the flavonoids I talked about before, produced by plants, those are there because they protect the plant. They protect the plant from oxidative stress, sunlight. They protect the plant from, from oxidative stress, the atmosphere, oxygen. They protect the plant from, from, uh, from insects, from, from anything that's going to stress the plant out. 
those plants have the ability to make these compounds as protective agents. We can't do that as humans. And so instead, we have to eat the plants. We have to ingest the plants to get those protective nutrients into our bodies. We can get them with olive oil, with red, red wine, roots and leaves and seeds and nuts and all those kinds of things. And the, one of the reasons that they are beneficial for us is because they're beneficial for the microbes. And we can grow the right microbes, we can get the right signals, we can get, the, we can get less of the bad signals, um, we, can, we can really put ourselves in a, in, a, in a good place. And those social interactions, which, which we're gonna talk about on a, on, a, on a different night, but very, very important. So um, the, 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 the data around Mediterranean diet for these mental wellness benefits has just been slowly, slowly creeping out over the last couple of years. So here's some, here's some research studies that I just wanna share with you real quick. So Mediterranean diet supplemented with dairy foods improves mood, but not cognitive function in an Australian sample. Results from the Med Dairy randomized control trial. So this study showed um, there was, a, there was a, a very nice effect on depression, anxiety, stress, but in this particular one, they didn't find a, they didn't find a sharpness in memory uh, in people who didn't, didn't have memory problems. Um, here's one that reduced depression with the Mediterranean diet. Here's one that, uh, again, reduced depression, Mediterranean diet and depression. Can a healthier dietary pattern reduce the risk of depression? And the answer is yes. Um, Mediterranean diet and depression, again. Association between Mediterranean diet, lifestyle, and depression. Um, so we know on the, on the good side, eating more Mediterranean diet can reduce your depression. I'm gonna show you, some, show you some, um, some data slides in a second to show you what the magnitude of that effect is. But we also know that you know, outside of the Mediterranean diet, we can look at specific food types and see how they predict more depression and how they predict more weight gain. And so this study, predictors of weight gain in a Mediterranean cohort, the, the, the less you adhere to the Mediterranean style, the less effective it is, which makes a lot of sense. But the more you start throwing in donuts and uh, processed food and soda pop, uh, those sorts of things, the more you're likely to be depressed, the more you're likely to gain weight, the more you're likely to have inflammation, the more you're likely to have these metabolic changes that are going to lead you down that road. Um, and so, you know, fast food and commercial baked goods and the risk of depression and weight gain and metabolic changes. Uh, and then this one, this is one of my favorite ones, partly because it has a really cool name, SMILES, um, Modified Mediterranean Diet Intervention for Adults with Major Depression. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I joked around on one of the earlier um, Project B3 uh, seminars where I was, trying to, I was trying to get across this idea that what we eat and how, we changes, how it changes the biome can change dramatically our mental wellness, our depression, anxiety, stress, behavior, performance, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, the, 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 the study that I was referring to when I was making this joke was um, just this past summer, uh, there was a research group that took a particular fiber um, called galacto-oligosaccharide or GOS, G-O-S, and gave it to kids with autism. Autism is one of those very classic gut-brain axis dysfunction conditions, right? You've got leaky gut, you've got, you've got a disrupted microbiome, you've got inflammation, you've got food intolerances, you've got gas and bloating and stomach aches. And, but then all of those gut issues are sort of transmitted through the rest of the body and you have behavior issues, you have social connection issues, you have you know, um, you know, mental focus issues and you know, all sorts of behavioral sorts of things. So classic autism, classic gut brain axis system dysfunction. Um, this research group, took this goss, gave it, to, gave it to these autistic kids for eight weeks. At the end of that eight weeks, they had a, a better microbiome, less gut inflammation, fewer gastrointestinal complaints, you know, so less gas and bloating and stomach aches, uh, fewer food intolerances, and overall better behavior. And that, you know, I joke around to say like 10 years ago, if a research group went to their university and said, you know what, we have a great idea. We wanna give autistic people we want to give them fiber to see if it changes their behavior. They, they, they literally would have been laughed out of the room. Same thing, same kind of an idea here. When, when these researchers, these Australian researchers, um, had the idea, hey, wait a minute, here's people with major depressive disorder, right? These people are, are severely depressed. 
What if we just change their diet? Maybe they'll feel better, right? That, when, when, when these studies started coming out, that was laughable that, you know, uh, how, how, how in the world is eating more salad and eating less hamburgers, how in the world is that going to help somebody with depression? It didn't make any sense at all. And, and you know, this, this, this particular SMILES trial came out in, in, uh, in, in, in 2017, and it's been so um, revelationary um, or, or revolutionary, I guess we could say that too, um, that medical schools are now starting to, to really teach their students about the, the impact on health, on cardiovascular disease, on dementia, on cancer, on diabetes, on obesity, all the things that I said before, of diet. So, you know, the physicians are never really gonna become, you know, nutrition experts per se. Some are, you know, there are functional medicine doctors who get a lot of training post-medical school. But now you're starting to see th th this, this be a prescription, right? Why not start with a Mediterranean diet instead of Prozac? Why not start here instead of one of these, you know, high side effects kinds of, kinds of medications? So anyway, you get, the, you get the idea. It used to sound like science fiction, but now we have such great data around it. And here's some of the data from the SMILES trial. So SMILES stands for supporting the modification of lifestyle in lowered emotional states. So you have depression, we're gonna give you this diet to help alleviate your depression. What that looks like, you know, one of the things that um, I think is a, is a not useful conversation for people to be having is the percentage macronutrients in their plan, right? There'll be all sorts of people saying, oh, you need to eat a 40, 30, 30, or you need to eat a 50, 30, whatever, right? You know, all of these things is, is thinking that the macronutrient blend is something magical and one's going to be more effective than the other doesn't really matter within reason and within reason what i mean is that balance is always going to win the day always going to win the day if you're an athlete for example i do triathlons and so this is how i'll eat most of the time in the week leading up to a big race like a 50 mile run or a 100 mile run or an ironman triathlon or something like that I might shift this a little bit. So I'm eating a higher percentage of carbohydrates. That 37 might go to 50 or 60 just for that small amount of time so that I can amp up my glycogen stores, but then I'll go right back afterwards. Um, so this is what a smiles or a Mediterranean style macronutrient makeup is going to look like 37 let's say 40 ish percentage of your carbohydrates are, are, of your calories are coming from carbs but remember what those carbs are it's salad it's high fiber it's fruits and vegetables when it is grains it's whole grains uh, an ample amount of fat but these are healthy fats this isn't steak and and burgers this is fatty fish. This is lean protein. It's lean pork. It's, 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 it's plenty of beans and rice, um, which, are, which, are, which are giving you fiber, which are giving you protein. And when you're using lots of olive oil in there too, and seeds and nuts, you're really having a, you know, what, what, what might look like a high level of fat for a lot of people looking at that saying, 40% fat. I don't know. I think if I ate that much fat, I'd gain weight, but you don't because it's very satiating. It controls your hunger, so you're not likely to eat again and eat again and eat again and eat again. So anyway, that's what the, that's what the macronutrient looks like. What happens, so let me, let me tell you what, what, what they did in this study. 12-week study, depression symptoms graded by something called the MADRAS scale. This stands for Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale. There's lots of ways that we measure depression in people. Sometimes we use profile of mood states. Sometimes we use the Hamilton scale, sometimes use the Beck scale. This one, th this one, they ended up using the Madras scale. Um, and that, that means that if you're a 60, that's as, that's as most depressed you could be. Zero is the least depressed. You can see that these people were pretty, pretty solidly depressed at baseline. Here's the two groups. One group got the diet, the smiles diet. One group got just support. They, they ate their normal, you know, terrible diet and, and they tracked them over time. After 12 weeks, the group on the on Modi Med, the modified Mediterranean, um, saw their score improve by an average of 11 points. That's a big enough change where they were depressed at the beginning of this 12 weeks. After 12 weeks, they were no longer diagnosed with depression. They were in remission, right? 
just a dietary intervention got these people to go from depressed to non-depressed. And it wasn't, it wasn't a hundred percent effectiveness, but it was, it was, it was pretty darn good. It was, that would be, this would be more effective than most antidepressant interventions, antidepressant drug interventions. So very, very effective. And the people who followed the unhealthy diet group, even though they were getting support, they, they really didn't have much of a change at all. They were still, they were still pretty severely depressed by the end of the trial. So that tells us really, really good data. So let me go back real quick. We know that if you're depressed, this way of eating can help you become less depressed. Um, the reason you would really want to try to do this is great. After three months, you're less depressed. Hooray. That's, I mean, that really is a good thing, but do you stay less depressed over time? And the answer is yes, that you do. There are other studies that have been done to show that in large data sets, 10,000 adults who were not initially depressed, right? So these are not people who have depression currently at the beginning. And then we follow them over time and we see how well they adhere to this style of eating. And then we see who develops depression over time. And what you see here is that the more you adhere to this kind of eating pattern, the less likely you are to develop depression. So there's two ways of looking at it. If you have depression, this can treat you. If you don't have depression, this can prevent you from developing depression. And it's a pretty huge effect. Here we're looking at a magnitude of, of, of um, effectiveness at the highest level of about half. So you're cutting your risk for developing depression in the first place by half, by 50% if you eat this way over the, over the course of four years. So it's very, very effective. It's very delicious. Um, but how do you structure that over time? Um, the reason that we're doing the nutrition piece, obviously, is to get all of these different macronutrients. You saw that you saw the the sort of pie chart of what you know what percentage each one is making up. They're all important. It's not like saying that protein is more important or fat is more important. You do see that, you know, out on social media where people are saying protein is the most important one that you need to have. Fat's the most important one that you need to have. Carbohydrates are the most evil one. You need to avoid that. None of that's true because they're all important for their own particular need. We need the protein for, for muscle maintenance. We need the carbohydrates for, for energy and metabolism. Our brains need 100 grams of pure sugar every single day in order to function at their highest, highest optimal peak efficiency. We need the fat for flavor and satiety, and we need fiber for digestion and satiety, right? They're, they're controlling our appetite through two different ways. And so we wanna make sure that we do that. You know, if we're, if we're taking in 30 grams of protein, let's say, at a meal, because we've got, you know, a chicken breast there, we wanna make sure that we're getting at least 10 grams of fiber, right? So you can use that sort of 30, 10 rule. Um, and you're gonna get that if that chicken breast is sitting on a pile of fruits and vegetables of, you know, some, while you're grilling that chicken breast, grill a tomato and grill some asparagus at the same time, coat it all in olive oil, put a bunch of spices on top of it and, and have a nice, a nice crusty roll on the side in a whole grain roll, blam, you're out of there with something that tastes really good. So that's why we need all of those things. We don't want to put one at primary importance over the other. Now, how do you put these together? There's two main ways that we can sort of structure our eating, right? We know how much to eat, helping hand. We know uh, that we wanna eat more high quality, less processed. That's the kind of the, you know, the, the, the quality piece of it. We know we wanna be selecting foods in that Mediterranean style. But how often do you eat? Should you eat uh, you know, several times a day? Should you eat only in the morning? Should you snack at night? You know, there are, there are two schools of thought here. Um, they're both valid. So I'm gonna present them both and then I'm gonna explain to you what I, what I think you should do. So the first one is, is, a, is a snacking approach to structuring um, how, you're, how you're doling out your food throughout the day. The snacking approach has you eating small meals frequently. So you're eating five to six well-proportioned meals or snacks using the helping hand, you're having a breakfast, you're having a snack, you're having your lunch, you're having a snack, you're having a dinner, you're having a snack. And so this is a way that, that 
predominates and is really good for people who, who, who get hungry often. This is for people who have trouble controlling their blood sugar, who get that crash of energy levels in the day, who, when they get, who get, who, this is great for people who get hangry, right? People who, if there's a space of more than a couple of hours between an eating occasion, um, that they'll, that they'll get quiet, that they'll get irritable. Um, this is, this is, this is me. Right. This is this is how I tend to eat. I'm also very physically active. Um, I get up pretty early. Uh, I don't get a ton of sleep. You know, even though we're going to talk about that next next uh, next seminar about why that's so important. What you're doing at each one of these. So you're so you're basically eating every every few hours throughout the day. Um, you're having a portion of protein and carbs and fat every time you eat. You're using the same principles of the helping hand every single time. And you basically have unlimited fruits and vegetables, right? So you can, you, you, you know, you can snack on those, get a good source of fiber and phytonutrients. Great. We know that this works. Um, I've used this for 20 years to help people control their appetite, control their metabolism, help to lose weight. But there's another way that we can structure it too. And sometimes this works better for other people. This is a fasting approach. So you've got the snacking approach where you're eating periodically throughout the day. And you're basically trying to stretch your eating for as for the for the maximum number of hours that you're awake. So you know you would think about this. This is an exaggeration, but as soon as you wake up, you're eating something, and right before you go to bed, you're eating something, and you're eating small amounts throughout the whole day. If there's a downside to that, sometimes people can get into the bad habit of eating anytime they see food thinking that this is a license to just shove food in your mouth every time that you encounter it. That isn't what it is. Remember, it's still, it's still sort of portioned out, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, 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 in between those. It's not a license to just eat whatever, whenever. Um, another way to really kind of put even tighter guardrails around your eating behavior is with a fasting approach. Sometimes this is called IF or intermittent fasting. This one does the same thing. You're avoiding sugars and refined grains. So you're avoiding most of those processed and you're gravitating towards least processed, more whole foods. You're letting your body burn fat between meals. You're only eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're not taking snacks ever. You're not having a between meal snack. You're not having a, a before bedtime snack. And you're very much limiting the hours of the day when you eat. You're eating early, but you're not eating late. You're really compressing the, the amount of hours during the day when you're eating. And what that, what that does is if you're only eating for the eight hours of 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. or the, only the eight hours of 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. or only during daylight hours, for example, and you're never eating, you're only eating between the time when the sun comes up to when the sun goes down, you're never eating it in, in, in the dark, so to speak. That is really compressing. So you're getting eight hours-ish of time when you can eat, and the remaining part of the day, the remaining you know 16 or so hours, however compressed you're gonna do, that's a fasting period. Um, that's gonna enable you to burn fat. It's gonna enable your, your gut to sort of empty itself out. Um, and there's, there's, there's maybe some advantages to that to some people. I actually eat this way, the snacking approach most of the time. And then once a week, I do a fasting approach. Um, intermittent fasting can be, can be difficult for people. Um, if you're going to try intermittent fasting, um, uh, understand you're likely to feel terrible for two, three, four days, right? Let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say three days, right? 72 hours. You're going to feel hungry. You're going to feel irritable. You're going to feel, uh, you know, low energy. You might have headaches. You might have brain fog. And if you don't push yourself through those three days and let your metabolism adjust, you might go a day and go, this is terrible. You might go two days and say, forget it. This is for the birds. Once you go through sort of that 72 hour period of, um, of limited eating during the day, no eating during the dark, limited eating during the day, no eating during the dark. You do that three times, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. On Thursday, you're very likely to feel much more energetic and better Friday and better Saturday and better Sunday. Um, some people I know will do the snacking approach during the week and then they'll do intermittent fasting on the weekend. Some people do intermittent fasting for five days of the week, and then they'll do a snacking approach for the weekend. There's all kinds of ways to sort of 
fit this into whatever lifestyle you have. But the moral of the story is that they both work and you have to find the one that works best for you in the right sort of a situation. Um, you know, again, I'll use myself as an example. Intermittent fasting will work sometimes. Um, sometimes I'll use it specifically during a hard training block. Um, when I'm really trying to emphasize fat burning in my body, but I'll tell you what, it is hard to do because when you're doing a long duration workout in the face of being fasted, you're irritable, your, your energy levels are low, but that's the purpose, right? You're trying to force your body to become a better fat metabolism fat metabolizer, you know, so like, you know, go into each one of these knowing that they have their, they have their pros and cons and there's no sort of black and white. This is absolutely the best way. This is absolutely the worst way. They really have their, you know, they have their, they have their advantages and drawbacks and you can use them. You can use them sort of interchangeably. Okay. But, but, but give them a try and see what works for you. So remember, don't fear carbohydrates. Stay away from donuts, stay away from cookies, stay away from fast food and you know, processed baked goods and things like that. But remember that carbs are what your body needs. That's your main energy source. That is your preferred fuel source. Uh, all the ketogenic garbage aside, um, your body doesn't really want to use ketones. Your body wants to use carbohydrates. And if you give it the right carbs in the right amounts, in the right balance, with fiber and protein and fats, your body is gonna appropriately break those carbs down into glucose and fuel your brain. The other piece of this is that people who study metabolism like me have, a, have, have this saying, fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates. So if we really wanna maximize your fat burning, we have to have a little bit of carbohydrate input at all times. The breakdown products of carbohydrates allow those fatty acids to enter the part of the cell where they're metabolized. So if you really wanna amp up your fat burning, you don't wanna restrict your carbs. You wanna have a steady, um, a steady dose of carbohydrates in the appropriate fashion, like we've talked about before, to really stoke that fat burning, uh, uh, fat burning machinery. Um, and and we, I said this earlier, but we really, really want to emphasize um, a, a, a higher intake of fiber. And if you're focusing your diet on that sort of plant slant that I talked about before, it's the base of every single plate, it's, the, it's a portion of every single snack, you're gonna get up closer to this you know, sort of 30 gram recommendation, which is even a little bit lower than probably what we need to have an optimized microbiome. Um, most, you know, so here's the recommendation, 25 to 35 grams per day. Most Americans only get about 10 grams a day. So if you're getting up in that 30, you're getting about triple what most people are getting. But if you look at a hunter-gatherer society, they're getting about triple what our recommendation even is. So if we're at 30, a hunter-gatherer society would, has a different, completely different microbiome than we do, um, they're looking at 100 or 150 which is a lot of fiber to try to get in. And that's one of the reasons that the GBX foods that we have, the gut brain access functional foods, um, have a lot of fiber. Every single one of those products has very targeted microbiome friendly fiber to help to nourish that microbiome. The reason we want all that fiber, it, 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 absorbs water in the intestines, it gives you a feeling of fullness, right? That's that sort of fiber-induced satiety, which is different than the fat-induced satiety. Slows the absorption of the carbs, which is going to control your blood sugar. Controlling your blood sugar is going to be good for your appetite. It's going to be good for your metabolism. It's going to be good for your energy levels. All that fiber is good for digestion and, intense, and, and, and intestinal health. It's going to help with your gut integrity. It's going to give the building blocks to that acromancia that I talked about before that's going to grow a, a, a bigger, um, a, a more protective mucus lining, which is going to protect your gut, which is going to reduce your leaky gut, which is going to reduce your endotoxemia, which is going to improve your metabolism, and it supports microbiome balance, right? It has a prebiotic effect. So all of these wonderful benefits of getting more and more fiber Fiber. And if you're doing whole grains, if you're doing brightly colored fruits and vegetables, if you're doing lots of beans, if you're doing all of that kind of stuff, Mediterranean diet style, you're, you're going to be getting all of this fiber that we need. So it's, you know, it all sort of comes part and parcel with that strategy 
of, of eating. So what are these, I keep saying, here's the hand, here's the fist, here's the okay sign, you know, all that kind of stuff. What do these actually look like on your plate? Um, so these slides are going to be posted up. Um, if you're watching on Facebook right now, I'm going to put these in the file section. If you're watching on YouTube and you probably got there from, um, from, from my blog, maybe SeanTalbot.com, uh, I'm going to post these up there. So you'll be able to like download these and have these as references. Um, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, um, uh, involved with Amari, you can go to amari.com and you can go in the resources section and you can get these, you know, you can get pictures like these, you can get recipes for other meals, you can get smoothie recipes that incorporate everything that I'm talking about here to give you ideas to really make this, you know, doable and, and, and delicious. So here's what a breakfast might look like. So what you're going to see on each one of these next screens that I'll, I'm just going to click through them real, you know, real quick for people. You're going to see a, a picture of the food. And then on the side, you're going to see how the food matches up with the framework of that helping hand. And what you'll notice is that all the foods that you're going to see are minimally processed. Um, and if they are something that's, you know, bread is processed um you're 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 gonna look i mean look at here you can see that this is like a this is like a peasant bread right this is you can see the seeds you can see the nuts you can see the rich fiber in that sort of a thing it's not that highly refined kind of a grain so here's a here's an option for breakfast here's another option for breakfast if you you know happen to have that happen to have that sweet tooth notice it's whole wheat when you're when you are choosing those grains Here's another breakfast. We're focusing here on the cottage cheese and the, and the, and the, and the fruits. Here's a lunch. You know, that's a lot of food. That's, I mean, that's going to keep you full for the entire afternoon, but it's not very calorically dense, right? There's not a lot of sugar there. There's not a lot of total calories there, but there's absolutely a lot of volume there that's going to fill you up. And there's a lot of phytonutrients there. And there's a lot of fiber there. Those are all going to be wonderful things for the, for the reasons that we said. Here's another lunch, a nice little stir fry, really easy to put together. Where's the fat? Well, the fat is the olive oil for the cooking, right? Nice, healthy fat that you're able to sort of infuse in there, and that's going to taste delicious. Here's another lunch, you know, a little bit on the lighter side, but you're using, you know, you're using some, um, some salsa here as a, a, as a way to, you know, improve that, that, um, that fruit and vegetable and that phytonutrient intake. Here's some whole wheat pasta with a nice serving of, uh, of vegetables. Here's a dinner, big salad. This is a common theme. I really want to see salads taking up at least half of everybody's plate, right? Nice, brightly colored salad, lots of phytonutrients, lots of fiber, lots of lean protein over here, and a nice, delicious whole grain in the form of brown rice. Another dinner, another dinner, another dinner. So you can see how these are easy, they're delicious, they're accessible, they're not complicated. Here's when we start talking about snacks. You don't wanna have just the banana. Even though a banana um, has great fiber, great prebiotic fiber, um, fairly low calories, you know, banana's gonna be 90, maybe 100 calories. Um, they're, 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 they're yummy, they're good, they're good on, on digestive performance, but add some protein and fat in there so that, you, so that you absorb that sugar slower, so you absorb those carbohydrates slower. Same with an apple. Apple's gonna be very rich in quercetin, one of the flavonoids that can help feed your microbiome and protect it. Um, it's gonna be rich in pectin, one of the fibers that helps grow good bacteria, but don't just have the apple, have it with a little bit of cheese, right? So now you're having some protein and some fat. Here's a, here's a, um, Here's a, a, a yogurt. I was talking about yogurt before. Choose, don't choose non-fat. And if you do choose non-fat for whatever reason, make sure that you're adding some fat. Add some full fat granola, fiber, crunch, satiety, um, all together. I would, I, would use a, I would use a full fat yogurt. This one I think says fat free right there. Uh, I would use a full fat yogurt, but make sure that you're getting the taste from the fat and not from sugar. Look at the label and make sure you're not getting any more than, you know, a cup of yogurt like this, ought to be less than eight grams, less than 10 grams of sugar, um, but, you're, but you're also gonna get eight or 10 or 12 grams of protein, then you're gonna be adding some fiber and some fat in over here with the granola. Um, vegetables and, and, and dipping sauce, right? Full fat salad dressing. Uh, so that you're so that you're absorbing appropriately. Here's a, here's another way of combining the apple with some with some uh, with some high fiber um, and high fat and high protein nuts. Here's yogurt with berries. 
here's, here's um, protein with fat. So you got some turkey and some, some avocado. So you see how that all sort of comes together and what it actually looks like on a plate with real food. You can always use this as a guide, you know, always trying to choose food every day, most days, some days, only occasionally use these however you see fit, you know, drinking as much water as possible, using the helping hand as that way to say, hmm, is this the right amount? Uh, and don't be afraid of, is this too much food? One of the things that I told people either last session or two sessions ago is that sometimes people will eat this way and they'll do it for a couple of days and they'll feel so full They'll feel so non-hungry, and that's not something they're used to feeling. They'll go, I don't think this is going to work for me. I think I'm eating way too much, and I think I'm going to actually gain weight. And they don't. And sometimes we'll actually analyze the diets for them. We'll have them write down every single thing that they eat for two or three days, and we'll put it into one of our nutrition analysis packages, and we'll show them, look, that breakfast was 411 calories. That dinner was 532 calories, right? We'll actually show them how many calories and they really can't believe it because it feels as if they're eating a lot, but they're not eating a lot of calories. They're eating a lot of bulk because they're eating less processed, higher um, fiber, more, more sort of bulky foods that are, that are filling them up. So that's what you end up, that's what you end up seeing there. Um, and that, that, that's it. That's, you know, that is the, maybe the easiest plan because it's not really restrictive. It's not something that feels like a diet. And that's one of the reasons that at the end of the pilot program that we did of this Project B3, uh, we had, you know, 90 something percentage of people saying that they would continue with the program. Uh, they lost weight. They didn't feel hungry. They didn't feel restricted. They didn't feel like they were deprived and they felt great. That's the biggest thing, right? First and foremost, this is a mental wellness program. Secondarily, those nice side benefits that you get are these body benefits in terms of your appetite and your cravings and your energy levels and your belly fat levels and your body composition and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, really appreciate you guys uh, joining me on this. Um, tune in next week when we're going to talk about um, stress and sleep and how those are really important pieces, as important as the exercise, as important as the nutrition, as important as the supplementation. It really is sort of that you know, that last piece of the puzzle to get people going in the right direction in terms of their body, their brain, and their biome. Project B3. Thanks a lot, you guys. Have a nice night. Bye-bye.